Thank you. A quorum being present, the meeting will come to order. As is our tradition, let's please stand and pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. Thank you. Welcome to our November 27, 2017 special town meeting. The warrant having been posted as required by our bylaws, we can commence with our special town meeting. I'll introduce everyone. I am Doug Story, your town moderator. To my right is Pam Powell, our town clerk. Below and in front is our board of selectmen, Jonathan Keep, Stan Wysocki, and Bob Skansky. With them are our town administrator, Don Lowe, and our town council, Robert Gibbons. Excuse me? Okay. And to my left is our advisory committee, Brad Cody, Connie Benjamin, Joel Meyerson, Ted Kirshner, and Brian Boyle. Before we start addressing the warrant, I'd like to review a few of our town meeting procedures. Uh, as a few people are still rolling in, um, but as you get here, please take a seat um, and remain seated unless you come up to speak. Um, When responding, uh, I'm sorry, I'm already out of order here. Okay, we do not allow the use of cameras during our meeting. Other than that, it is being filmed by Bolton Access Television and will be available for review on, on television. Uh, we use town meeting time as our Bible, so to speak, along with Mass General Law and our own bylaws and traditions to guide the proceedings. In Bolton, our quorum is 75. We have reached that easily tonight. Once a quorum is declared, which it has been, we'll assume a quorum exists unless it is doubted. All decisions tonight are votes of yes or no. I think that's easier than I or nay, so we're gonna go with yes or no uh, on motions before us. The main motion is the wording of the warrant article or a close revision that the moderator has accepted as being within the scope of the article. So we're voting on motions, not articles. But what you did receive in the mail was the warrant with the articles on it. And the main motions should be very similar in scope to the articles. Other motions to the main motion have different hierarchy and rank, which guides the order in which we take them up. And there also are different rules as regarding those motions, and I'll explain those as we go along. We do allow a voice vote, and in the case of a two-thirds majority vote, a moderator's decision uh, may be questioned if there are seven or more voters who don't agree with me. Uh, the moderator also, this is one of my favorite rules, may decline motions that are deemed frivolous or tending to disorder. We do have standing microphones on both sides of the aisle here. That's where we'd like you to speak. Any registered voter can speak, and if you wish to, please come up to one of the standing mics and form a line. I will recognize speakers in turn, and if we need to have a guest answer a question, I will recognize them as well. Please do not speak unless I recognize you. When you are recognized, please state your name and your street. Address all your comments to the moderator, I, in turn, will call on others as appropriate. When we're responding to something someone else has said, please respond to the issue, not the person. Keep comments focused on the issue before the meeting. All motions, including moving the question, must come from people who have been recognized at one of the microphones. If you speak without being recognized, you're out of order. Uh, 
One exception is the Board of Selectmen Advisory who need only raise their hands and I, I will uh, recognize them when they need to speak. Um, if anyone is physically incapable of rising to a microphone, we'll get a mic to you. So please let us know, raise your hand, and uh, speak out if you need to have a mic br brought to you. In the interest of keeping the move meeting moving along and allowing others the opportunity to speak, please keep your comments to no more than two to three minutes. I'll give anyone a friendly reminder if we go beyond that. And uh, those, agree those presenting uh, a presentation tonight have also agreed to limit their time. And tonight we only have two articles, so we're going to go perhaps a little bit longer than normal on that first presentation. Um, please check your cell phones and mute them. If anyone has a computer, please mute that or turn that off. We, we have had electronic disturbances with the mics in the past from computers. Um, as is practice in Bolton, all households have received a copy of the warrant in the mail. So I will not read the articles in full, but simply refer to them by number and by a brief dis description. Are there any questions on procedure? Seeing none, with that, let's commence with Article 1. And this is uh, the article that is relating to transferring from available funds $450.26 for the purpose of paying unpaid FY17 bills. What is your pleasure? Move the article, Mr. Moderator. Article's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on this article? That being the case, I don't see any discussion. We will vote on this issue. We'll do a voice vote. So again, uh, we're going to do yes or no. So first we'll say all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Are there any opposed? That is a unanimous vote in favor. I should have said that this required a nine-tenths majority being unanimous. We clearly have reached that. Article 2. Um, the first, th this is a good example of um, a situation where we are going to slightly change the wording of the article that was mailed to you, and that will be the main motion. So we're not doing that as an amendment. We don't need to vote on it. I just want everyone to be aware that there has been a change made, and the change. Um, is a very simple one. Uh, Ken, do you want to yeah. make that change? Oh. Well, I'd like to move the article as written with two numerical changes. The first one is in the second line. And this was act because of an administrative error in the writing of the article. And it should now read $1,077,700. And then the other change is near the bottom of the article <clears throat> where it lists the sort, what the, uh, where the appropriations come from and to change the one from available funds from 10200 to $27,700. Those are the two changes in my motion. Okay, so just so that everyone is clear, and I believe you're looking at it on the screen, um, the warrant article said $1,050,000. The main motion, which is the thing that we will vote on tonight, is for an appropriation of $1,077,700. And that is taking into account uh, the borrowing costs uh, associated with this. So I've accepted that as the main motion, and uh, that is what we'll be voting on. Is there a second on that motion? Second. The motion has been seconded. 
All right. Um, I do want to point out that um, the uh, selectmen did uh, vote to oppose this tonight, two to one, and the advisory committee is going to give us their recommendation now. Mr. Cody. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> advisory voted four to one against uh, this article. Also, I would remind all of you that in light of this being a special town meeting, it's important to take into consideration the totality of everything, and we generally meet in this room uh, the first part of every May to review the entire budget and all capital items. Um, all department heads over the past few weeks have been submitting their budgets. We have not begun the FY19 budget process. However, uh, that will begin in earnest in January. We do have a listing of available capital items that department heads have put forth. So uh, this is a f very fluid component. However, as of right now, we're looking at 1.4 million in capital items that we will be discussing next May. Now again, I mentioned that is very fluid, uh, namely for the fact that when we were all last here together in May, I gave you a number of 1.2 million on what we we're expecting for FY19, and uh, that includes an $800,000 Sawyer roof uh, number that has been pushed to 2020. So um, I wanted to share those numbers as we entertain and, and think about these numbers that we're looking at tonight. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Cody. Okay. Um, do we now have discussion on the article? Hi, uh, uh, Brian Burby, 25 Manor Road. Um, as, as the current chair and representative of the Conservation Commission, I'd like to hear Sorry. It might not be turned on yet. Hello, uh, um, I'm Brian Barbie, 25 Manor Road. Um, as the current chair and representative of the Conservation Commission, I'd like to make a motion and have some brief comments afterwards. Um, I would like to move that the second paragraph shall be amended to read that the Board of Selectmen be authorized to convey a perpetual conservation restriction in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 184, Sections 31 and 32 to the Bolton Conservation Trust and that the Board of Selectmen be authorized to enter into all agreements and execute any and all instruments uh, as may be necessary on behalf of the town of Bolton to effect said purchase. Um, if I can comment briefly on that amendment, um, this amendment was voted on at our last Conservation Commission meeting. Um, the reason for this amendment, with the, the information available to us at the time, um, we thought it made sense to make a switch to having Bolton Conservation Trust be the holder of a restriction upon this property. Um, Bolton Conservation Trust has been our, our preferred partner um, in deals such as this in the past. Obviously, they're local. Their mission with regards to conservation land most closely matches our own. And, and we've had success partnering with them in the past. So we thought, with the information we had, it made a lot of sense um, to propose this amendment. Um, that said, I, I do want to say that the, the original proposal of Sudbury Valley trustees um, is perfectly well, perfectly fine with us. Uh, both Sudbury Valley trustees and the Bolton Conservation Trust are both well-respected, well-organized stewards of conservation in this region. Um, we are quite happy to work with either of them. And regardless of the holder of the conservation restriction, um, it doesn't influence the town's conservation regulations or any of the rules that are governed by our bylaws. Um, again, the reason I bring this up is, is that this amendment was approved uh, with the information that was available at the time um, and that we're always happy to partner with, again, either Bolton Conservation Trust or the Sudbury Valley Trustees, regardless, uh, depending on what's more beneficial for the town. Um, it's really all I have to say. I'll, I'll take any questions if anyone has them. Thank you very much, Brian. Does anyone have any questions about the amendment that has been proposed? Daphne, uh, Bolton Conservation. Uh, 
Um, so in light of a letter that, we, uh, that the selectmen received on the 22nd of November from SVT, SVT has um, proposed that they actually purchase two of the lots. Dan, can you hang on one second? Yeah. I did not get a second on that motion. We want to do that first. Is there a second on the motion by the Conservation Trust? Thank you. All right, Dan, go ahead. So I Okay, there has been a point of order raised whether or not a second amendment can be placed on top of the first amendment, which is what Dan is proposing to do. Thanks for asking that question, Brad. Going to town meeting time. We did discuss this before we started the meeting, and um, it is entirely appropriate to amend an amendment. An amendment to the primary amendment is called a secondary amendment and itself may not be amended. So we can have up to two amendments at any time on one amendment. Um, let me step back further. Were you asking about the dollar value change? Okay. Um, as I pointed out early on, if it wasn't clear, this dollar change is not an amendment. I have accepted this as the main motion. So this is the main motion. This is the original issue we're voting on uh, as the main motion is the dollar value. Conservation Trust has proposed an amendment to change the conservation restriction to the Conservation Trust. Dan Gaffney is now speaking to us and I believe he is going to propose an amendment to that amendment. I'll keep track of it now. That's hopefully. right. <laughs> okay, so in light of the letter that came in from SVT for $250,000 um, to purchase two lots to assist in this whole process of getting the Camp Virginia, um, you know, uh, proposal to happen, they, one of their uh, requirements in that 250k uh, proposal is that they either hold the CR or co-hold the CR with Bolton Conservation Trust. So the reason reason I'm up here is to propose a second amendment to the amendment that Ryan just made to um, to state that. Um, that the Board of Selectmen be authorized to convey a, a perpetual conservation restriction in accordance with MGL Chapter 184, Section 31-32 to Sudbury Valley Trustees and the Bolton Conservation Trust as co-holders. And I'll take questions on that. Second. Second. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to um, clarify where we're at and I'm going to have Bob speak just a second Bob so we are now in the secondary amendment we are only discussing the change of the amendment to state both Sudbury Valley trustees and Bolton Conservation Trusts as the holders of the conservation restriction that is what we are debating right now are there any comments on that Bob for which few members of the town have any familiarity. And I would ask that um, for the purpose of promoting this discussion, that copies of the letter that was referenced moments ago be distributed. Okay. Um. <laughs> Does anyone have that letter handy? Would anyone, if anyone would like to see that letter, Dan has it in his hands, and uh, they certainly are welcome to look at it. I believe we have multiple copies. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to once again back us up. The original main motion, as worded in the article, had the conservation 
uh, easement in the name of Sudbury Valley trustees. So that was in the motion that was mailed to everyone, or in the article that was mailed to everyone. Uh, the Conservation Trust has since proposed that it be changed to the Conservation Trust, and the, the secondary amendment has proposed that we put both names in there. Okay, so that's where we're at right now. We are discussing whether or not both the Bolton Conservation Trust and the Sudbury Valley trustees would be uh, listed on the conservation restriction. Kathy Junta, Fox Run Road. I have a question about the, the amendment. I am trying to understand the rationale of the Sudbury Valley trustees and why they want that change. My understanding from what I've read, and it could be mistaken so someone can correct me, is their intention in putting up the $250,000 is to purchase those two lots to bring the purchase price up to something that's more in line with what the Girl Scouts are expecting and looking for. And that their intention is then to do some engineering to make the lot saleable, sell them, recoup what they have put into it, and perhaps donate whatever the proceeds are that are remaining back to the project. So that says to me that at that point, they're done. So I do not understand why they would be interested in therefore keeping or co-keeping the uh, the conservation restriction, as opposed to our own Bolton Conservation Trust having it solely. So if someone have, can explain to me what their reasoning may be, and if we don't know, that's fair, but it would, I would expect we would have asked such questions. Dan? So Sudbury Valley Trustees um, holds many, many, many CRs in many towns across the state. Um, their sole purpose is to make sure that those lands are always protected. They do a wonderful job in maintaining and making sure that the way that the conservation restriction is written is followed. And they actually come out on an annual basis, they walk the properties, and they make sure that those properties are indeed following the letter of the law. The difference here with the Kent, Virginia property versus all of the other properties that we have in town are, I believe most if not all of the properties at least that the Conservation Trust is involved in are what we call passive recreation. So you can use them as, as is, um, you know, for everybody's enjoyment. If we take a look at the Camp Virginia property, this is going to be an active recreation property. And that's a bit different. We have a waterfront that needs to have specific uh, requirements that have to be followed. Sudbury Valley Trustees has been doing this for a long time. They've written the language for those CRs for ma many other locations. And that's really what they do. So they've done a lot of work in helping this process go forward. And one of the things that they ask for in return is to hold that CR to make sure that th there are no issues with that property in perpetuity. Stan? Yes, I just want to address the comments made by the speaker before uh, the speaker. Uh, that speaker is correct. The, the article that we have before us is to purchase just 50 of the 56 acres. That has always been the premise. As a matter of fact, in negotiations that our town administrator had with the real estate agent that's been authorized by the Girl Scouts, the two lots in question in this letter that you're going to be reviewing were always excluded from the purchase. We received this letter, the Board of Selectmen received this letter at 2.15 on Wednesday of this past week, the day before Thanksgiving. The Board of Selectmen have not had any opportunity to discuss this as a board. Uh, the speaker before the, la the current speaker is also correct in that Sudbury Valley Trustees is putting up money to purchase the two lots that we were never going to be purchasing in the first place. 
and you know, at the point in time that there, there, you'll see a whole bunch of conditions in the letter that they'll move forward with this, and that if, the, if they're successful in selling those lots, uh, and if there's any surplus left over, and there may be or there may not be, depending upon whatever cost they have to incur, they, they will probably provide that extra revenue or the surplus to the town. But it's not known at this time how much that's going to be, if anything. You'll also notice in the letter that the Sudbury Valley trustees have not even voted on this yet. So everything in the letter that you're reading now is subject to a vote by the Sudbury Valley Trustees Board of Directors. I believe it's on December 13th. So the offer that they're providing, they have not even voted on. So we're talking about something that's not yet official by Sudbury Valley Trustees. Is there any other comment on the, the amendment to the amendment? Uh, good evening, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Graham Sleeker, Whitcomb Road. Um, I have a question. Um, looking at this and from what I've heard, it appears that we're interested in subsidizing about 25% of this purchase by exchanging a cold co-holder relationship between SVT, uh, uh, let's see, yeah, SVT and Bolton Conservation. If that's true, um, what I don't see here is what happens when they disagree in some decision to be made. There's no mechanism that I see here for arbitrating this um, reasonable question. If I read this correctly, it seems that we have 50% interests, they disagree, who breaks the tie? That was my question. Per perhaps it's here, I didn't see it. Dan? So as with any conservation restriction, it hasn't been drafted yet. This will be a fairly complex uh, conservation restriction, and in that conservation restriction will be the, the basically the rules of the game so that we Good. can identify them. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Yep. Okay, if I could just uh, remind everyone, right now we have before us the secondary amendment, which is to add both names to the main motion. Is there any other discussion on that amendment? Money. or can raise privately an equal amount of 400,000 but it doesn't mention anything about an equal amount being in this letter so does this go away if we don't get the grant but we do raise the money uh, I'm not quite sure. It's just contingent can, on the grant. Can we please speak that's to the I, microphone? That's what I thought, but I wanted to make sure. Right. Yeah, and art number two on that page. Okay, thank you. That's my question. Yes, we didn't hear that. Could you please speak to a microphone? This goes away. don't get the grant, then this goes away, correct? Is there a point of order? Thank you. I'm sorry. Oh, mine either. Okay. Now it's working. We'll take our time, make sure we can all hear it. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, Mr. Herbert. I can bang it, but I can't talk. My question was just that does this go away if we did not get the grant? The letter. The SVT, the, the deal okay. with... If, if I could just clarify one point on the letter. There has been a letter distributed. If anyone wants to see it, please raise your hand and maybe somebody could pass a copy around. Um, we are not voting on this letter, okay? Right. 
the letter is not the issue before us. The letter is a, an explanation um, of what led to the amendment, the secondary amendment, requesting that we add Sudbury Valley trustee's name, which was in the original warrant article. So it's certainly within the scope that that name be in there. Um, and we're really just voting whether or not that name is there with Bolton Conservation Trust. We are not voting on an agreement with Sudbury Valley trustees or the merits of it. That would be outside of the scope of this vote here and would be handled by the Board of Selectmen at a later time. Is there any other discussion on whether or not to, ex on this particular secondary amendment? David? Dave Lindsay, uh, Berlin Road. I don't think, maybe I haven't been listening as carefully as I should, but I don't think we've heard the Bolton Conservation Trust's opinion on the amendment to the amendment. In other words, if they want to be a trustee, do they mind if Sudbury Valley is a co-trustee, or would they prefer to be the only trustee? Is it a deal breaker for them if, if uh, good, good Sudbury, question. yeah, so, so. I'd, I'd like to have, hear the conserva Bolton Conservation Trust's opinion on the amendment to the amendment. Good question. Brian? Conservation Commission? Trust. Okay, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> so the Bolton Conservation Trust opinion and how we voted um, as a board is that we want to be able to support whatever the town's wants are. Now, when we take a look at having SVT involved in this process, we believe there's a tremendous amount of value in that. Therefore, we would like to see them as partners with us in holding that CR. Just because they have the knowledge, they have the leverage, they have the legal expertise, on how to properly draft that, and they're willing to help us with that. So from that perspective, we would like to see uh, a partnership um, for that particular holding of the CR. Thank you. Move the motion. Second. Okay, the motion, uh, the, 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 there has been a, uh, a motion to move the question, which has been seconded. Uh, this is a, let's see, a simple majority, I think. Um, without debate. All those in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed? No. no. That passes by a majority. The question has been moved, and that is the amendment to the amendment. So we are now voting on the secondary amendment to include both names, Dan, did, can you give us that in writing? Uh, the amendment as proposed that Dan read, which includes both the names of the Sudbury Valley trustees and the Bolton Conservation Trust as holders of the conservation restriction. Uh, this is a simple majority vote as well. All, and, 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 that was seconded as well, so. All those in favor say yes. Yes. All those opposed, no. No. That passes by majority as well. Now we will vote the amendment. Um, So this is a little complicated, but we accepted the amendment to the amendment, but we also have to vote it as the amendment. So now the amendment is what we just voted to approve, which is to have both names on it. We have not, we can have, no, we did have a debate on that. It's the same exact thing. It really is the same thing, but we do have to vote both. So we are voting on the amendment. All those in favor say yes. Yes. All those opposed, no. Okay, that passes by a majority as well. Now we are back to the main motion, and I apologize, we're now going to have our presentation. <laughs> I'm gonna try this one and hope this works better. <clears throat> I can't Ken, Ken, Ken ask, um, 
just when you want to have the slides changed, if you could just say next as you do your presentation. All right. Um, so I'm Ken Troop from Meadow Road. I'm a former selectman and former advisory committee member, and I also worked on last year's open space plan. I lived in town for 42 years, and 40 of those have been in the town government. <clears throat> um, you can go to the next slide. So we're having the town meeting for two reasons, really. The principal one being that the grant we applied for has to have the town vote by the end of December. Uh, or else we're not eligible for the grant. So that's the main reason we're here. The other part of it is that the Girl Scouts, who actually wanted to close a year or so ago, have said they would like to close a deal of some sort before the end of the fiscal year. So that's what brings us here tonight on a special town meeting. Next, please. Uh, so we put together a year or so ago an informal group. It has former officials on it, uh, has longtime residents as well as new residents, and there are even a couple of people who on it who, since the group was formed, have become volunteers on uh, town boards in the town government. Uh, there are a number of other people who have helped us, and we appreciate uh, all the work that they've done. Um, next slide, please, is a map to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Camp Virginia is south of 117 and east of 495. It's between Long Hill Road and Hudson Road. You can see right at the top of the property, which is outlined in red, uh, West Pond, and then across Hudson Road uh, is Little Pond, the smaller Little Pond, and the Camp Resolute area that's over there. Uh, next slide, please. So Camp Virginia, along with Camp Resolute, are the two largest privately held recreational facilities in town. And they've been sort of on the town's radar for many, many years. They've been in the open space plans for the town to make sure they're protected either privately or publicly uh, since 1980. And we have a chance with this meeting to sort of uh, get a piece of Bolton history, to protect a, a piece of Bolton history uh, by buying this property. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I mentioned the grant. We can talk in more detail about it later. Uh, but I did want to acknowledge the outstanding work of Ashley Davies of Sudbury Valley Trustees and what she did in helping us to put together the grant and get it submitted and walk us through that whole process. It has some requirements in it. One of those is that it has to be open to all. And the comment I would make about that is that other towns have found that the revenues that they generate from fees to out to non-residents often are the difference between paying for or not paying for the operations of a site. And so it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have everybody uh, be able to go to it. I mentioned the vote by the end of the year, and then earlier we mentioned the conservation restriction. Those are also in there. But if there are other questions about the grant, th those can co certainly be covered later on. Next slide, please. So this is a detailed map. Um, the lots that were mentioned earlier are the two yellow uh, insets on the left-hand side on Hudson Road, and then there's a piece to the upper part of the little neck that goes out there onto, um, onto Long Hill Road. And you already know about the letter, so I won't bother to talk about that. Uh, so I want to introduce now Laura Roberts, who will tell you a little about the uses that might be made of Camp Virginia. Thank you, Ken. Hi, I'm Laura Roberts. I've been in Bolton, um, living on Annie Moore Road for about five years now with my family. Um, I'm also a member of Bolton's Human Services and Safety Committee and the Parks and Recreation Commission. But tonight I'm speaking as a private citizen and not representing the views of the commission um, in whole. So I want to tell you more about how Camp Virginia can serve as a multi-purpose park for our town. It really has the opportunity to be a recreational asset. Many people say we have lots of conservation land in Bolton, so why do we need this property? And the difference is that this isn't just going to be conservation land. This is going to be a one-stop shopping, if you will, park for all of Bolton to use. You can see here some of the parkland that's available in Bolton. Um, many of our town fields and our playgrounds are only available when school is not in session. So families like mine often go to other towns to 
visit bike paths, use playgrounds, or other recreational facilities like picnic pavilions. With that, we have um, three parks, Pond Park, Persons Park, and our new Town Common. As you can see, the Town Common has greatly expanded the recreational options here in Bolton, but still, it represents 15 acres of parkland. Camp Virginia will add 50 acres of parkland to our town. One of the great things, next slide please. One of the great things about Camp Virginia is it's not raw land. This property already has many assets that will be available immediately for our use. It has great potential and ample space for us to continue to invest in it and for it to serve Bolton for many generations to come. You can see here the town, the camp um, beach on West Pond, which can be used for swimming, non-motorized boating, and fishing. Um, we currently lease our town beach from the Boy Scouts for just a dollar a year, but this will ensure that Bolton for future generations will always have a town-owned beach available to them. I've heard from many residents, particularly those um, our senior citizens and those who have limited mobility who tell me that the town beach is difficult for them to access because of the hill that they have to descend to get to the beach and the root structure that exists there. I know every time I bring my kids, one of them does a face plant. So, I'm <laughs> so I can tell you that the beach from Camp Virginia, as you can see here, this is the view from the parking lot. It's a very flat, um, way to get to the beach and it provides uh, new accessibility for those with limited mobility. Thanks. Camp Virginia also contains a number of usable structures. There are two picnic pavilions like the one pictured here just uphill from the beach and each pavilion already has picnic tables, three stall restrooms with modern pit toilets, and sinks as well as grilling pits. Uh, many of the uses for Camp Virginia are available immediately and others such as renting these pavilions for a family gathering and camping will require some planning on our town's part and establishment of appropriate policies and fee structures. Um, there's also ample space for community events. This is a large field that's adjacent to the, t to the parking lot. The parking lot is also very large this field can be used for recreation, community gatherings, and play. What's really unique about this property is that it provides, as I said, the one-stop recreational opportunity for residents. A family will be able to come here and launch their kayak and go fishing and also swim at the beach, all in the same location. Children will be able to toss a frisbee on this field while their younger sibling is playing on the beach and mom and dad will still have each kid in eyesight. You can go for a hike, enjoy a picnic lunch, and take a swim at the beach and you don't have to get in your car to go to another location. Um, so last, lastly, I'll just say that Camp Virginia, as Ken mentioned, has been a camp since the 1930s in our town. It's a historic property and an opportunity for us to acquire a recreational asset that will serve the town for many generations to come. Once we lose this opportunity, it's gone. It doesn't come back. The potential is here now, and the expanded use of the property over time, based on the desires of our community, fundraising, and careful planning through our town's budget process, will be there in the future. So now I'd like to have Ken talk about the cost to the town. So one of the important things about a recreational property is that it, it takes money to make it run. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so these are some of the things that, that have to be dealt with as far as operation and maintenance is concerned. And I would, would mention, I guess, Specifically, the, the grounds and maintenance and trail cleanup are things, uh, there are possibilities of volunteer labor and others, but there, there definitely is a cost to the town. And there's effort, more effort than you would find in a piece of conservation land to manage it. So one question is how do we manage it? And the next slide 
has an answer that uh, we believe and other towns believe works. And that's a management committee. Um, other towns have these. Westford has one for a camp that it has. And what they draw from, as is suggested here, are the various town boards, the local conservation trust, uh, Boy Scout organizations, other organizations who might use it, who would put this together. Um, and the first really important thing that, that this group would do is to prepare a long-range facilities plan that would really lay out what the uses were going to be, what the fees were going to be, how it was all going to be operated and put together. Um, and it would oversee operations with any part-time labor that might be needed. Falmouth just a few weeks ago voted on a land purchase that included a pond and they created a committee or at least assigned it to a committee uh, to do oversight on that. Um, Harvard has a committee that manages uh, Bear Hill Pond. And so this is a common way to do it in a way that, that volunteer labor can be applied to reduce the cost and to manage the facility that's there. Uh, next slide, please. So there are five types of expenditures. Two of these you're going to vote on tonight. Uh, two would be in next year's budget, and then future capital improvements would become part of the capital planning process that the capital planning committee and the advisory committee work on, and they would be basically outputs of the long-range plan that the committee would put together. Next slide. So the borrowing for this is a, would be 10-year notes, um, and assuming that the grant comes through, which is a condition of this vote, uh, the net would be $650,000. The annual expense for interest and principal is $78,000. That'll decline a little bit as you go along because uh, it gets paid off every year, but it's, it's a reasonable way to think about that as, as 78 being, being the, the, with the principal and interest um, that we'd be required to have. Next slide. Uh, now, when we visited the advisory committee a couple of weeks ago, uh, they asked some really good questions about startup costs. And so these, these are uh, some that relate to some research that we've done in the time since we met with advisory. Um, the ones that are shown here uh, deal with an ADA compatibility study and with the path that actually goes to the pond, the one that, um, that Laura was mentioning that's necessary even though it's reasonably flat to make sure that a wheelchair can go on that. And we can talk about that during later discussion. Um, and then the other one would be, it may be possible that an, uh, some equipment might be needed to move some of the larger pieces of wood off of the hillside where the logging was done. Most of that work, I think, can be done by volunteers, but we put in some money there. Um, this $25,000 would probably be money that would uh, come out of next year's budget, although uh, it's possible that that the town might decide that they would want to spend free cash this year on that. That would be determined, obviously, by the town government later on. But, but the, this is in the order of magnitude of what we see the startup costs as being. Next slide, please. So this is the annual budget. Uh, we had an estimate of $43,000 as typical operating costs for the year. Uh, we have a slide later that can be brought up, but that's not the main part of the presentation. But if you want to go into those details, uh, we have the data that's there. Uh, this brings the total to $121,000 a year. Uh, and then there are the closing costs that we talked about at the very beginning of the meeting. Uh, that includes borrowing costs and the first few months of interest, because basically it would carry it until June. And then the 10-year notes would kick in in June. Uh, next slide, please. So the tax impact on this is somewhere between $23 and $60 per house, depending on how much your house is worth. The middle column is the average house. Um, and on the tax rate, that's somewhere in the vicinity of 8 to 12 cents. Um, now, we have the operating cost on here, but I would remind you that the operating cost would actually become part of the town budget, so you don't see the actual impact on the tax rate in the same way that you do with debt excluded uh, borrowing, but it's, it's approximately half uh, of what the, the borrowing cost would be. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, the other characteristic besides a park costing money is that a park can make money. So there are opportunities for generating revenue. 
And there's a lot of experience in other towns, and I'll tell you that, uh, that Westford and Bedford and Acton especially run their parks on money that they make. They're, they're self-funding. And it, uh, it may take a while to do that, but it's certainly possible to do it. And these are some of the kinds of revenues that are possible once the camp is in operation, once fees have been established, once programs have been set up in the way that they would run, there are certainly opportunities to offset a lot of those costs. There's also the possibility of setting up a friends organization that could do fundraising, and there's in-kind labor. Sudbury Valley has already indicated that they're willing to do trail maintenance and, and even trail construction in conjunction with our trails committee, so that's certainly possible. Uh, so there's really no reason that over a period of time we can't make revenue. Now, I would never promise that you can do that in the first year or two to offset all costs, but it's certainly something to look at and consider as we go forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, as Laura said, if this isn't preserved, it's lost to development. Uh, you'll have houses here and the developers are anxious to build them. Um, when I, I have two sisters-in-law who went to Camp Virginia. And I told them that one of the reasons that I was working on this was so their grandchildren could see where they went to camp. Well, that won't be possible if it isn't bought. And the next slide uh, is sort of what we don't want. And I wanted to quote uh, a resident, uh, Herb may be here, but Warren Colby, a longtime Bolton resident, um, who was a founder of the trust and a longtime member of the Conservation Commission, used to say, build what needs to be built and preserve what needs to be preserved. If we act the way we intend to tonight, you would build two houses and no more, and you would preserve 50 acres. And I think Warren Colby would be pleased with that. And the park will be usable for generations to come. And the last slide is a thank you, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you, Ken. If uh, anyone who has any questions could come up to the microphones, please. Kathy? Kathy Junta, Fox Run Road. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative, and it did lead me to a couple of questions. Um, the camp has been closed for the last four years, so although I've heard that the facilities are all fine and dandy, it seems to me that there must be something that needs to be done to bring them up to current codes, usability, and I haven't seen any numbers on what that would take. I also haven't seen any numbers on what it would take for ADA compliance. And although I saw a study, the park application as written promises ADA compliance, and it's to be available for all. We should clearly have ADA. And I wonder if we haven't had a chance to do that yet, but could we not have looked at what, the co what it cost on the town common for their ADA compliance and at least use that to make some assumptions, and I didn't see that. And the other question, third question I have is, I have been hearing for a, a long time about fundraising efforts, and it was brought up here, but I have yet to see any. And I'm wondering why that hasn't at least started. So that's three things. Fundraising, cost for ADA, why we couldn't have some assumptions, and cost to at least bring the existing facilities up to something usable at the get-go. Do we have someone to answer that? My name is Noel Dill and I'm Nashaway Road. I'd like to address the second of those three questions, which is to do with the ADA compliance. I am not an expert on ADA compliance, and so I took the unusual step of calling up to people at the state and federal level discussing the situation and asking them what would need to be done in order to, for us to use the property uh, at the get-go and how that would be handled in the future as changes were made to the property. The fundamental issue here, uh, issues fall into three categories. One is parking for handicapped parking. And in this situation, I was told at both levels that we would require four handicapped spaces, of which one would have to be um, wide for van access. These 
Parking areas do not need to be paved. They just need to be stable terrain so that people can get in and out of their vehicles and they need to be demarcated so that they can be located by the people that want to use it. The second issue that they brought up, and this was at the uh, federal level in particular, uh, <clears throat> was to do with beach access. And the requirement for beach access is basically this access for someone in a wheelchair to get down to and into the water. If the terrain is firm and the grade is uh, not um, too steep for them to traverse it, which I think in this case we're pretty close to that because of the uh, geography of the space, then no accommodation needs to be made other than the path has to be there and, and marked and they can um, wheelchair down. If you reach a point where there is sand or other loose material, then the recommendation at the federal level <coughs> was that you could use what is called a beach mat. These are sold specifically for this purpose. They're four or five feet wide. You roll them out for the length, and so as we get to the point where there is sand and then into the water, you would have to provide something of this sort. I priced a couple just by ads without doing any quoting. They're about $60 a foot, so if you get close, you go across the beach and whatever, you're a couple thousand dollars into it for uh, accommodation to meet that requirement. The uh, final issue, and the one that I think most people most think about in terms of ADA accessibility, has to do with building access. And the short and simple answer to that, again, from both the federal people at the New England ADA Center and the uh, compliance officer, William Joyce, at the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board, is that day one, you don't have to do anything to these buildings. You can use them. No accommodations need to be made until such time as you make improvements to the buildings that exceed 30% of the value of the building as it stands prior to any improvements, at which point then you're obligated to make the accessibility changes, ramps, whatnot, to the buildings. So the bottom line is that in order to achieve ADA compliance, we need to put up some signs and mark out a parking area. We need to assess whether or not the terrain is traversable by wheelchair, and if not, to put down a simple mat condition to get people into the water. And beyond that, nothing else needs to be done. Any questions? Not that I have any more answers. I told you everything I know. Nobody? One? Yeah. Bathrooms. Again, until changes are made, no changes need to be made. But, excuse me. At the moment, it is my understanding that some years ago, the Girl Scouts put in handicap um, stalls in each of the bathroom uh, structures that they have there. And again, until changes of substance are made to the buildings, we're not required to make any uh, further accommodations. Now, the bottom line is that we all want these buildings and everything else to be as accessible as possible. And to that point, we did some further investigating and con contacted a uh, consultant who I think has his offices uh, in Lancaster, Mr. Uh, Bob Karasiti. He's worked with a number of different um, towns and whatnot, including Concord before the AAB. And <clears throat> he indicated that an initial overall assessment of the property would cost about $3,500. And sometime in the future, that kind of thing should be budgeted. and then if he <clears throat> should have to be in attendance at various planning meetings and whatnot, then that's, you know, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a piece to um, do each of those things. Um, <clears throat> if you recall the slide of a few steps ago, uh, we budgeted as startup costs 
$10,000 for ADA compliance. And I think that more than covers everything we've discussed here that is, needs to be done. Any other Thank questions? You. Anybody that wants yeah. to uh, look this information up can get online at the Mass AAB and look at the regulations there. Please, please come up if you'd like to make a question. Thank you. Did you want me to do the other two first? Or yes, there were no? two other questions. Uh, okay. Fundraising and structures. So the, um, thank you, Neil Darcy, uh, Oak Trail. Um, I'm just wondering if the, uh, the ADA information that was just read is uh, part of what the grant process says, that there's actually review, I believe. I don't know, the administrator handles this grant moving forward. Is, is that official? Uh, documentation the town has as far as what um, is the final process in the park grant itself. I believe I believe in the grant it says that you have to uh, have an ADA compliance review, and is what we just heard the ADA compliance review. Don, Don Lowe, I'm your town administrator. Um, I don't know that it is the ADA compliance review. Everything that was just said is news to me. I've not heard it before tonight. What I do know is that, is that day one, we would need to comply with any applicable ADA regulations, and the town has not done any costing to that effect at this point. Thanks. Ken, do you want to answer the other two questions? First question, I believe, was in effect, the condition of the buildings and, and what would be likely to happen with those and how that would be handled. Um, we did a review, an informal review, with the facilities director of the Girl Scouts that included uh, an engineer and a couple of other people from our group. Um, they concluded that there are some buildings that would most likely uh, be demolished. Um, there were some buildings that they concluded uh, could be used, pr primarily the ones that are down near the water and the uh, two pavilions that Laura spoke of are in quite good condition and those and their bathrooms would, would likely be retained. That isn't to say that there's no work that would be needed to, on them to make them usable, but those are in, in pretty good shape. Um, all the buildings except for those pavilions are locked and so to the extent that any of the locked buildings need to be demolished, there's really no rush. There's nothing there that's falling down to the point that it would be in danger to the public or anything of that sort. And so there's no reason that the town couldn't, just really the way the property is right now, leave some of those buildings locked until they decided what they were going to do with them. And if they decided that they weren't worth keeping and should be demolished, then that could be done either by volunteers or through the budgetary process at some time in the future. There's no huge rush in doing it. And if it's concluded that there is a use for a building, I'll give you an example, the infirmary building that, uh, that is near the beach and sort of faces the beach um, has several rooms in it. And it might well be something that uh, when the, the beach and the area got active, that the town might want to put a concession stand in where uh, where people could sell refreshments or whatever it was. You'd need to do some work in there to put in a proper kind of, of kitchen or other facilities that would need for that. But the building is in decent shape to do that. Uh, however, until that happens, it's locked. It's not hurting anybody. And so there, there's really nothing that would need to be done to it. So some work has been done. Some things have been identified, but uh, detailed costs have not. I mentioned the long-range plan that, uh, that, that I would recommend that the management committee do. Uh, that would be one of the first things that they would do, is really to assess in more detail each of the buildings, how they would use it, whether it should stay or not, and what would be involved in, in it. Uh, I don't see any of this happening really, really fast. It seems to me that, uh, that the important thing is to preserve the land. And once it's preserved, you can take all the time you want to figure out exactly what you're going to do and exactly how you're going to do it and exactly what it's going to cost to do it. And so, um, so that's, I think, the way that, that we would recommend that the committee really deal with 
what the buildings are, how they were going to be used, which ones should be fixed, which ones should not be fixed. Thanks. Um, now, what was the, did you write down the third one? Yeah, just, to, uh, I think Don had a clarification on that, or a comment on that, facilities. Don Lowe, your town administrator. I've been asked to clarify for town meeting that the town is not in possession of any inventory list of the buildings, and we do not have um, a list that shows us the condition of each of the buildings at this time. Thank you. I believe the third part of the question was fundraising and whether or not any had been done. And no, it hasn't. <clears throat> that's the that's the simple answer. I'm really thinking more for the future related to operations. Um, the decision was made uh, during this process that uh, that the grant paying 40 percent of the cost was a good chunk and that additional fundraising at this time when the common has yet to close and so all of the outstanding loans that Bolton residents are carrying and things of that sort are still there that it made no sense to really do fundraising to lower the the borrowing cost to the town but it makes a lot of sense going forward to do it I might also mention that uh, that the state has in addition to the grant that we applied for has a series of small town grants. We applied for a large town, even though we're a small town, but they are small town grants that are mostly for things like fixing buildings and stuff like that. They're $50,000 a year rather than 400,000, which would be perfect to retrofit a building or whatever it might be. And so part of, of the planning going forward would be to find those kinds of grants in addition to do the fundraising that's necessary for the operations once we understand what, it, what they are. Thank you. A microphone on the, my left here. Uh, John Tremblay, 5 Little Hill Road. Um, I have a lot of standing in this situation. I live on the pond, I live in West Pond, and there's 13 or some odd other residents that live on the pond. So this is very clear and dear to our hearts. Um, specifically, I, originally I was I was for the the, um, the movement of town to more broader use uh, use of the town by this, but then as I learned more about it, I said, well, what is the implication? The whole state coming in to use that. I grew up in Wakefield, Mass, where there's a beautiful lake, and I used to swim in that lake, and there's no way you can swim in that lake anymore. It's 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 polluted. It's uh, it's really changed the environment. If you look at um, Walden Pond, the amount of use that goes on in a state park. Um, the trails are overrun. Um, I, I live on Long Hill, and if you look at my road, Long Hill is a cut through. There's a tremendous amount of trash just from Hudson alone that I have to go on the road and pick up trash on a monthly basis. Um, so that's just Hudson. So what is now a whole state going to do? Um, Miles Standish State Park in Plymouth. A lot of a lot of things have changed that town. Um, so originally I was for it, but then I wanted to learn about it. Well, now we're opening it up. It was just a bolt and fine. It is a small little pond. And uh, it seems like everything I've heard tonight so far is a little bit of a land grab. We want to grab it, and I understand that. But I um, spent 18 years in the pond, um, and I've seen the pond is changing environmentally. Uh, the pond used to freeze over a lot more than it does lately, so it's not freezing over as regularly. It's the natural evolution of the pond going from pond into a swamp. It's shallower. The weeds are, are deeper. Um, fish. Um, 18 years ago, the fish were a lot bigger on the pond. The, the fish are very small now. You don't see a, a nice-sized bass anymore. So um, I haven't heard anything about what the ecological impact is. I've talked, I heard a lot about Silicon Valley Trust, the Bolton Conservation Commission, trust and, and but I haven't heard anything about the ecological impact of now opening this up to anybody in the state to overfish to pollute to clean up and um, you know so that has me you know concerned just that we haven't even talked about that so um, I'd love to minimally hear the the Conservation Commission's view on what the ecological impact is um, and the potential threat to our little pond and um, so it is some Conservation Commission could talk to that is there someone who'd like to answer that? Anyone from conservation? Uh, Brian Barbie again from Conservation Commission. Uh, to be fully honest, we, we really have not studied that question um, at this point in time. Um, the Conservation Commission itself, 
didn't actually adopt an official policy on whether or not the town should acquire the land. Um, when this first came up to us, it's, it's basically been our opinion that this is a question, it's, it's a big opportunity, it's a really big cost, and that this should go to a full town vote. Um, so we've basically stayed out of it to that extent. Um, and we really haven't conducted any more in-depth study than that. Um, that's about all I could tell you at this point. Not sure if anybody has Thanks. any further. Okay, your point's taken. Thank you. Next speaker in the jacket here. Yes. Uh, my name is Alec Leon on Main Street. Um, I moved into town about six years ago, and I really enjoy it. Um, my first response to John's question about ecological impact is I was thinking about the impact of 10 homes going into that area, and a number of them, maybe all of them, maybe not, um, putting a lot of chemicals on their lawns to maintain them at peak appearance. Um, and I think about a chemical runoff going into that pond. I think that'll have a big impact on the ecology of the pond. Uh, that's not what I came up here to talk about, though. Um, Earlier we saw a slide that suggested to me that my tax impact on an annual basis would be a little over $60 uh, based on the value of my home. Uh, if the town buys the property. If the town does not buy the property and 10, uh, ten homes are built in that area, what would be the tax impact of supporting those homes? Uh, granted, each of them is going to develop, uh, provide some tax revenue to the town, but there are going to be services required by those homes. And I'd like to know if anybody has thought about the tax impact of those services that they will need. Thank you. Does anyone want to answer that in the front here? <laughs> I, I was going to take this to a different level. I'd like to first quote Thoreau, who said... Excuse, excuse me? I would like... Could you introduce yourself, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I am Nan Norseen. I've lived in Bolton since 1954. I still live on Harvard Road on a different... I've moved my farm back a little bit. So I'm at 23 now. And, uh, in fact, I used to have an address on Main Street, but we turned it around the corner so we could have Harvard Road. Anyway. I've been here a long time. And I'd like to quote Thoreau, who lived on Walden Pond, and came up with the idea that in wilderness is the preservation of the world. And if we don't take care of it, we won't have it. And this is a rare opportunity to help the planet. So I, I'm not, I think we all have enough ingenuity to figure out the few problems we're talking about here tonight, but we won't have another opportunity to save some beautiful land. I, right now, have all my land in conservation restriction because I have watched the pink lady slippers come back. I have another orchid on my property called rattlesnake plantain, which is destroyed every time a house goes in here. I have two endangered species of salamanders on my property and I treasure them. And I think it's time that we think of Bolton as a treasure and that we need to take care of it. Thank you. Thank you. Please hold. John Jasensky from Harvard Road. A um, couple of points, um, and someone just actually began referring again to the issue of um, buying this property to stave off housing development in the town. And I ask the people here, have you driven around Bolton to see the fact, and I don't think it's an uh, exaggeration, to say that there are hundreds 
of undeveloped acres in the town that are parts of farms, forests, what have you. Are we, each and every time that another parcel is going to come up for sale, going to buy that to stave off development? How many tens of millions of dollars will it take to do that? So there's a fallacy in that argument. Yes, it might meet the immediate need, but that's one million dollars in a town that has no commercial tax base or industrial tax base. It's all us, it's all taxpayers trying to foot the bill for these. So yes, I love the rural character of Bolton as much as anybody, but I try to be realistic. We will never be able to afford to buy enough land to stave off development and preserve the character of the town. I do have one other point that I'd like to raise, and that pertains to the overall funding aspect of this versus the town budget. We spent the better part of the past hour, if not more so, talking about the niceties of having this piece of land become owned by the town. And we spent perhaps a minute and a half talking about the fact that we've got $1.4 million worth of potential expenses in the coming fiscal year, which is about six months from now. I would like us to spend at least a little more time putting the purchase of this land in the context of the town budget so that we're not here in the Christmas spirit halfway between town meetings deciding how nice it would be and then coming to the reality in May that we just blew our budget for things as frivolous oh, as the traffic lights on Route 117, which is becoming a very dangerous and potentially fatal highway, just as one example. So can, uh, if it may not be too much trouble, can uh, the advisory board provide some more detail in terms of the expenses that we are facing as a town so that we can begin to try to put the purchase of this within the context of those expenses that we're facing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Let, let's try not to applaud, please, and let the speaker speak. Thank you, Brad. All right, thank you. Uh, so to the previous speaker's question, so yeah, I mentioned earlier, uh, we're looking at potentially 1.4 million uh, this coming May. Uh, as mentioned, um, uh, that's about 250,000 more than I mentioned that to you when I was here last May. Um, things have changed, department heads have uh, moved numbers around, uh, pushed it out another year. Uh, FY20, we're looking at uh, 2.1 million. So if, if you only want to think about this May, that's fine. If you only want to think about tonight, that's fine too. But the numbers will not go away. Um, my experience with this capital plan, uh, again, this is an initial view. This represents the town. It, it, we have numbers here from the fire department. We have DPW numbers, you know, such things as equipment needs that these departments um, have indicated to uh, all of us that, that they need, whether it's a, a vehicle that is uh, at its end of useful life and looking to be replaced, um, water supply compliance upgrades, uh, long hill culvert, uh, skid steer loader, re replacement of engine four for the fire, um, sewage treatment plant, truck repairs. Those are just a few from the town uh, for this coming May. From the school side of the house, flooring replacement, uh, interior painting, column repairs, uh, Sawyer mechanical heating replacements at the high school, leach field, flooring repairs, hot water tank. So there's a lot of a lot of items on parcels uh, on within departments that we own already that we need to continue to maintain. I mean, it's no. I'll ask you. Everyone's got a water heater in their house. It's not really sexy to have to replace it. Kind of sucks, right? However, 
How about a water heater for the school at $90,000, right? So again, it's just like the stuff that we have to deal with in our home. There's certain items that we absolutely have to buy to get through to the next month. There are other items that would be really nice and it's exciting to buy. So those are what's on the capital item. Now, there's a few other things. Again, I mentioned earlier that we've not yet begun the, the budget process. Um, there, we had an advisory meeting last month. The fire department came before us. Um, in light of some personnel uh, changes, uh, analysis, there's talk of uh, added bodies for the fire department to cover day shifts, right? The town is changing. We don't have uh, everyone living in town, working in town, living on their farm and can jump and, and head off and cover a fire like what used to be the case. A lot of us work out of town, work in Boston, so there's not as many townspeople to rely upon. So we're now having to start looking at hiring folks. So there's an initial estimate of 90,000 a year annual uh, salary costs for two additional firemen. Again, all of this is very preliminary. We've just heard this. We're still working with the fire department to find that. That's just one example uh, in light of all the other capital items. So um, yeah, as mentioned, uh, at the start, uh, there is, while we're here focusing on white, uh, one item, it is our responsibility to remind all of you that, uh, that it is uh, representative of an entire budget and, and overall process, so. Thanks, Brad. Stan. Just to follow up on that, um, one other thing that, that Brad Cody did not discuss, and the, the chairman of this, the school committee is here. We also need to keep in mind that, if you recall a number of years ago, uh, the previous administration somewhat rushed a proposal to upgrade the science labs at the high school, and that was defeated. But the need didn't go away. The need is still there, and it's, it's even become more critical now. Now, there have been a number of studies in terms of space needs studies and how to reconfigure the high school and, and whatnot, and there's going to be probably additional groups looking at that. But perhaps not this year and maybe not next year, but at some point in time in the not too distant future, there'll have to be some amount of serious renovation done to the high school. Now, it's a regional high school, so lucky us, we only get to pay a third of it. But we're talking about millions of dollars of renovation that has to be done. It's not, it'd be nice to be done. It's gonna have to be done in order for the school to remain competitive and for us to retain our accreditation. The roof on Florence Sawyer High School is not a nice to have. We have to do that. So I understand it's important and I, and I can understand people wanting to preserve land but as in all of your households, you have a budget. And you only have so much money to spend. And sometimes you spend more money, you go into debt, but that's everyone's individual choice. But at the end of the day, we have a budget. And we have a myriad of competing items that we have to deal with. And I know you're all concerned about your taxes, and you're all concerned about the tax rate and you're all concerned about the amount of debt that the town has. So I think it's important, especially since we're dealing with this, for lack of a better term, in a vacuum. What, what the selectmen and the advisory committee would have preferred is that this particular item be dealt with in the context of an annual town meeting where all this could be discussed as, as, a, as a total. So you know, we, can't, we can't really definitively quantify the impact of what this purchase will be vis-a-vis -vis what we may have to spend next May or the May after. But just so you know, it's coming. And we have to find the money someplace. So Thank you. just want everyone to be informed. At the mic over here. Okay. Um, 
Randall Porteous, uh, Sugar Road. I'd uh, like to make a motion to amend the original proposal um, where it says that, you know, contingent on the grant and private funds, I'd like to see the private funds removed so that it's strictly contingent upon the grant so that if there is any private funds, they can be used to m help maintain the grounds as opposed to the purchase. Okay, we have a motion. Point of order. Yes. Uh, just so you know, the anticipated amount or the, or the amount that the, the grant is for is for 400000 Right. But we may get less than 400000 so the, the article was worded such that if either we didn't get the full 400000 or we didn't get the grant at all, then there would be an opportunity to do fundraising to get that 400000 to make the commitment. And I will also be making an amendment shortly because in this thing there's no time limit on getting that money for private fundraising. And we need to put a time limit in there, and I'll make an amendment on that. But I think if you make an amendment that says it's the grant only, well, and we don't get the 400000 or we don't get the grant, you, you do effectively kill the, the purchase. Well, okay. So if you don't get the grant for the amount of 400, then I don't think we should go forward with it. I mean, are you... I, you, well, you might, you might want to let the, 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 yeah. the group that wrote the article explain why that they wrote it that way. But okay. I'm just letting you know that, you know, for some people, you may be shooting them in the foot. Somebody is, to okay, there's been a motion made. Has, is there a second on that motion? I need to have a second before we debate the motion. If there's no second, we will, not, we will table that motion and move on to the ongoing debate. Okay, there has been a second made on the motion. We're gonna need the wording of that, please, if you could come up here. So if I understand what the, um, what the proposed amendment involves, uh, the question has to do with why the or equivalent fundraising is in there. Um, I think Stan covered it well, that it was to allow time to raise money if we were able to do that. The time frame involved uh, can certainly be added to the article, but the same time frame of with the grant, which would have been this spring. In other words, the closing, if you approve it, the closing would be as soon as town council was able to finish all of the things that need to be done for the closing. Um, and that we had assumed would be somewhere in the March time frame so that we'd be able to, to finish the process. So if there's money to put on the table, then fine. If there isn't, then it's dead. I don't see the need to add anything and I don't see any, any particular gain in removing the language, but frankly, I have no objection to moving the language because I think, well, if we get the grant, it will be probably be $400,000 anyway, and so um, it really doesn't make any difference. But I don't, it, to me, it's a somewhat pointless, uh, pointless, and the time frame is, is really dictated by the Girl Scouts, and so I'm not concerned about the time frame. It'll be this spring. Okay, so I'd like to clarify the amendment um, that has been proposed. I believe what I heard was that we would remove plus any amounts raised privately from the contingency that we would not purchase this unless we received the grant. In the amount of 400,000, so it's not changing the fact that there is a contingency that, that a 400,000 grant be issued, otherwise the selectmen would not have authority to move forward. That would still remain, but we'd be removing the language plus any amounts raised privately. Do we have wording? Okay. 
I'm going to read this um, on the second page of the warrant, the first paragraph, uh, provided, however, that the funds appropriated, this is what it currently says, here under shall not be expended unless the town is approved for a parkland acquisition and renovations for communities park grant from Mass Division of Conservation Services in the amount of 400000 and the amendment is to strike the words or the amount of any such gr uh, grant plus any amounts raised privately equal to at least 400000 So we're striking that phrase and clearly stating that it is still contingent upon receiving a park grant of it in the amount of 400000 So it's not changing that. Is that clear? Is there any debate on this motion? Seeing none, we'll vote on the motion to amend. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed, no. No. The no's have it by majority. So that amendment is not made. Now back to the debate we have right here. Do we have a microphone? Yes. Uh, Sally King, Coventry Wood. Um, I've lived here since 1971 or two, I believe. Uh, been through a lot of town meetings and never spoke at one before. And I wanted to speak is because I think uh, most of you who know me know that I'm very conservative with um, the land and my love for the land and all that kind of thing. Um, I'm also very conservative physically. Um, and I heard both, both of these men who just spoke recently uh, address the issues that I had. Number one uh, being I hear that we're going to need um, science, a uh, new science lab at the high school, and we're going to maybe need a new high school and all those kinds of things. So I don't want to go over that again. But I want to say that I'm very torn with this issue, as probably many of And I want to thank Ken and the group. I listened to the young woman over here, and uh, the things she said was that she had to go out of town to take her kids to do things, because things are closed down. It just went off. Um, and that bothers me, and I've, I've been around other towns, and I see the ballpark for the kids, and there's a big sign, open only on such and such a day or certain times. I think that the whole idea of the bond is going to change because everything changes in a town anyway. I'm, I'm getting older. It's not going to do a whole lot for me, uh, tax-wise, maybe, and that's why I want to mention that. But I'm going to end by saying this. We have two boards here uh, whom we have elected, and both of them have uh, basically voted against this because I think there's a lot more homework that needs to be done in how the whole park would be handled and so forth. We have a new park. We have a new library. We have all these things, all the wants. And uh, this is this just reeks of putting everything out on credit. So for my generation and so forth, please understand, I love the wilderness. I love that park. My granddaughter's going to camp there. And my daughter went to camp there, which is inevitable. And we need to be, because after a while, we don't have the tax base that we need and so forth. So with your boards, because they're the ones we've elected to give us good advice, especially that group over there. Thank you. And thank you, Ken, and everybody. for. The okay, we're going to go to the microphone on my left here. Uh, Kia Oceanbine Main Street. Um, I guess I had the opposite reaction to the two most recent um, lists of all the things we're going to need in the next five, ten years. I urge everyone to think much longer term because this is a, an asset to the town that would really pay dividends much further off. We're not talking about a lot of money here. 
And I think that of all the litany of things that the advisory group just, just detailed, a lot of that is short-term stuff, and it's going to be worked out. Um, our debt is falling. It's falling faster every year. Florence Sawyer debt is coming off in, what, two years? That's a huge chunk of money. It can also be put toward more school renovations. The library and police station debt is falling quickly. That I think we have about 13, four, I don't know, 12, 13 more years of that. We're not going to be building another big, big, uh, you know, big buildings like that. We may have other needs, but all of those needs, as things come off, we add on as town meeting decides every year. That's sort of an equilibrium. So I urge you to think more about what this is. For under a million dollars, you can get a prime piece of property. It would make one of the nicest places in town. And it's an intergenerational town, uh, intergenerational space. Bower Spring is about the only place I could go with my 91-year-old mother to enjoy outdoor nature. Because you can walk side by side, and it's not rooty, it's not rocky, it's not like most of the other conservation land in town. Once we have build out, we're going to need this space. 30, 40 years out, we're going to need this space to be a special town. And we don't have a whole lot going for us except for our fantastic outdoor lifestyle. So this would be just another piece that would keep Bolton special and unique as a town along 495 that is really different than all the other towns. Thanks. So I would urge you to vote for it. This microphone here. Uh, Robert Cohen, Harvard Road. And uh, I saw my neighbor get up and speak. I just want to remind him, in the last couple of years, they built six houses uh, at the bottom of Harvard Road. And we're not asking the town to buy individual properties, but just special properties. We moved to the town in 2005, and I went in to get a document notarized at the town hall, and the next thing I know, they volunteered me for the Conservation Commission. <laughs> and I will tell you, it was my lucky day, because I met a lot of wonderful people, and I was able to work in some very special projects. My first project was the Weatherby Farm which is next to Bower Springs, which is currently the most used piece of conservation land in town. And a developer wanted to buy the house. And, uh, um, and the Weatherbees came to the town and said, we'd rather keep it intact and keep it in the town. Would you buy a conservation restriction? So I went around. I didn't know many people in town. I got some names. I spoke to a lot of people that have spoken tonight, a lot of the people that have served the town so well in front of us. And they all said, don't bring it up because we're fighting over the school budget and it will get knocked down. And if it gets knocked down once, you'll never get it again. Well, the problem was if we didn't buy the Weatherby conservation restriction, that would all be houses today, right next to um, our most used conservation land. The next project was Fyshire Dam, where there was a big um, to-do about it on how to solve the problem to make everybody happy. Again, we worked on it, we got it in way under budget, and now we can enjoy that land. The next thing I got to work on was the pipeline running through town. And thanks to all my wonderful neighbors out here that helped me, we were able to stop the pipeline before anybody else in the state. And again, we have another special project, and that is 50 acres that is not just a lot, it's a whole area for the town to enjoy. It's a facility that we don't have in this town. There is no other facility that's even close to this. So I'm asking all my friends and neighbors out here to think about what a special property, and we're buying it at a huge discount rate, 40% off list price. What could be better? It is Cyber Monday for the town. Please vote for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. This microphone over here, please. Hi, I'm Judy Leonard, um, 42 Burnham Road, almost 50 years in Bolton. Um, I've seen a lot of wonderful things happen because of the conservation land that's been bought. 
and does protect a lot of our town. However, on this, um, on this one, I'm so ambivalent about it. Um, I think if we had a lot of money, there'd be no doubt about buying it. But I feel what, um, I don't know what her name was, but about what she said about the advisory board and the selectmen, they are here to advise us. And after the last town meeting, um, I think the money could be better spent. The other thing I wanted to ask was, I think it was Ken had said that there is no other property with a, with a town beach, but we have Persons Park. And I don't know if you've been there, you can drive down to the beach. Um, there's a, there's a, it was donated to the town. The town also takes care of um, plowing it and the maintenance on it. So the small grants, I think it was Ken that mentioned, mentioned them like for 50,000. Maybe we could get a small grant and put that into Persons Park and, and create that be and the our other beaches right across from it. Um, that and one one other thing. Oh, if we did get um, Camp Virginia and made it an active recreation, so who pays the uh, liability insurances? The money that went, the money that we brought in from um, from um, Camp Virginia that's gone and then this becomes a cost so do we have how how would the liability get paid if we did the the extra made it an act of property that's all i have thank you right here uh, nancy case water quarter kill um obviously i had no intention of standing up here and speaking tonight I'm not exactly well dressed. However, there were chores to be done and it was calm and I felt that it was pretty important to be here. Every year we're gonna have budget items. Every year we're gonna go in debt. All this is gonna happen to us. I think we're losing sight of what we're voting for tonight. If we don't vote yes, it's down the tube. We need to protect ourselves and try to get this grant. That's our best shot at this. So I urge you to vote yes tonight. We should have had a town meeting, annual town meeting. It should have gone before. It couldn't happen if we had, if we could, if we had to go after this money. We have to go after a yes. We still have a town vote to go through. So I hate to see this destroyed tonight with a no vote. We still have a chance. You can still go and vote no. But let's get through tonight with a yes vote. Remember, let's not burn our bridges. Thank you. Microphone over here. Uh, Austin Clark Hudson Road um, I have a question concerning the park grant application uh, in it it states that there's a sidewalk to, or a walkway to be built from center of town to Camp Virginia uh, I haven't seen any numbers on what this will cost the town why the town agreed to it and for it to be in the application and if it's not supposed to be there why it was put there and are these stipulations in these the park grant there's about three of them three or four um, that were written into the park grant but have not been presented to us uh, and I'd like to know one why that is two how much it will cost and three if the sidewalk is not built what are the repercussions to the town because it's my understanding that that is a, a stipulation in our uh, application for the park grant thank you Don All right, uh, Don Lowe your town administrator I'm going to try to keep up with the various questions if I miss a point please let me know um, it was stated in the park grant that there were plans under the Complete Streets program to build a sidewalk from the center of town to Camp Virginia. There were never any such plans. I, when I became aware of that, I called the grant awarding agency and I said, um, this statement is not correct. This town has no plans to build this sidewalk and never did. Also, there was a reference to future plans for a playground. Again, I said, the town has never had conversations like that. There are no plans to do that. The grant awarding agency thanked me for informing them of that, and I asked them what, if anything, I should do about that. 
as the town's chief executive officer, it's my responsibility to make sure that a, a grant is judged on accurate information. The grant awarding agency told me two things. One, as far as the sidewalk goes, there would not have been any additional points awarded for that. However, as far as the playground goes, they would have awarded additional points for that and appreciated being told that that was not in anyone's plans. So on their, on their direction, on their advice to be shared, uh, to be fair, not direction, I ordered that the grant be uh, amended and a, and a revised grant submitted uh, so that it reflects accurate information and is scored appropriately based on, on what is factual. Um, that, and, I and I did do that. I also asked our new DPW director if such a sidewalk, to answer your question, were to be built, what would the approximate cost be? And of course, he did the best he could on very quick information. So this is not meant to be to the dollar. Uh, it was about 1.7 miles. Um, it was at minimum $400,000 to do that. And also bear in mind that the town does not own the junction of 495 and 117. From roughly Sugar Road to Hudson Road, that's controlled by the state. Also, when you get to the overpass, there is literally no footprint for a sidewalk, even if we wanted to put one there, because we have discussed that in the, in, in the past. So I don't know if that answers all of your questions. Go ahead, I think we can hear you. No. No, the amended grant application had reference to the sidewalk removed and reference to the playground removed. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Microphone here. Jane Jasensky, Harvard Road. Um, what, what I'm concerned with and what's bothered me about this process tonight is that it's been put before town meeting to vote on something, voting on the purchase of this property without us really having the information that we need before us to make an informed decision. There were some dollar figures that were discussed briefly at the beginning about um, what the cost, the purchase price costs were, the finance costs, and guesses about what the annual costs might be for operating and maintaining the property, but there really were no specifics. There was no specific information about the, um, the condition of the buildings, um, just some idea that we think they're just, they'll be okay to go with at least when we first open, but no information about, no one's inspected them, no one said whether or not they're there's any, anything falling apart in the buildings that's going to need to be fixed in order for us to use them. Um, everything from, there was all the questions, or even somebody brought up a, the point about ecological impact. What would the ecological impact be if we were to open this up as a park on the area? It just seems to, and um, or even the status of where things stands, stand as far as accessibility right now in the, um, in the camp, on the camp grounds, and whether or not we would want to bring those up to code, whether or not we're re required to is one thing, but would we want to improve what's there to make it more accessible for people who are handicapped in some way? And also, there's also said, and it seems like we're going voting for over a million dollars to purchase this property, and we can't seem to afford microphones that work. <laughs> but. <laughs> and, and actually, the operations cost, if, you were, if we're going to be operating at a beach, I'm assuming we need lifeguards and we need um, other kinds of, of, in order to make it safe, and that the whole question of liability insurance, which I think somebody else brought up already, what are these costs going to be to the town? So it's not just this purchase price that we have to look at. We have to look at what the annual cost would be to run this because we're making a decision now that's going to have the impact years down the road of how are we going, what are we going to have to be paying and how will we pay for that. 
Yes, we may be able to get some fees in to pay for some of that, but maybe we won't get as much money in as we think we will, depending on how much it's being used. So I just feel like we're being asked to make a decision and not being given all the facts we need to, to make an informed decision. Thank, Thank you. you. Over here. David, <coughs> David Wiley, Green Road. Uh, just a word uh, in response to the uh, talk about Persons Park. Some people are saying that that's a, that's a town-owned beach. Uh, there's no parking there, and there's no way to have parking there because it's uh, the waterfront there, which could in fact be turned into a beach, uh, is at the bottom of a, of a steep wooded hill. And uh, up at the top of the hill is the cottage, which has some historical value. And even if it were torn down, uh, there's not room for a parking lot. You've got to have a parking lot before you can have a town beach. Uh, it seems to me that the town beach ownership is the no-brainer no here. I go swimming there every summer a dozen or so times. I see parents teaching kids to swim there. Uh, people are having so much fun at that beach. A town beach that is owned and, and predictably and dependably owned by the town adds value to every single house in town, and including my house and all of your houses. We need a town beach, and this is a, a chance of a lifetime to get one, and a good one. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to this microphone here, and I just um, want to make one point, which is that I would appreciate it if any any other speakers who'd like to speak have new information or new issues to discuss, that's fine. It, we, we, we've been around quite a few important issues, but we don't want to just rehash them over and over again. Thank you. Okay. Give it a shot. I don't shot. have new information, <laughs> sorry. But I do just want to, can I just, I'll be quick, but I just want to say, um, so my name is Melissa Salen. I live on Long Hill Road. We've been here. Uh, my family and I moved here a little over a year ago, so we're Bolton newbies. Um, but we moved here to give this town a gift to our kids. And I feel like, sorry, I'm very emotional about it, but I feel like um, it's really important, the schools and the education and what we put into that. I, I do agree with that. But I also think you have to think about the long term and what gift we're leaving behind. And by making this investment, and also you know, some of the efforts that were talked about up here around the committee and having a group of people who are raising money and to, to do some creative things to make this self-funded you know, is something that t will take out of the budget eventually. But it has to be a long-term plan. And the same thing even with how we're going to fund our budget. I mean, we need creative ideas for how to do that because, you know, there's lots of opportunity, I'm sure, in there as well. And so I guess my point is, is that, you know, we have to balance everything, but we should be thinking long term and long term for our kids. And, you know, I think $60 in your yearly tax bill, at least for our family, um, I feel like is um, I'd really be willing to pay that to give my kids and other people's kids that gift. And I'd like to be standing up here when I'm you know, in my 70s saying I've been here for, you know, 45 years and this is, you know, how, what I've done, so. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely new information, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my name is Ed Sterling from Still River Road. I have been involved in the Boy Scout uh, organization since about 1998. I moved up uh, having been a chairman in the town of the troop and the uh, Cub Scout pack, and for a number of years now, I have been up at what we call the district level. Boy Scout camps are not owned by the Boy Scouts of America in Texas. When a local council goes away or merges, there is no rescue plan by the national headquarters of the Boy Scouts. Uh, all these properties are owned locally. So the parents of the Scouts in the area are in a sense the owners and stewards of these Boy Scout camps. I assume that the uh, Camp Virginia probably closed due to the massive societal changes where children are not engaging in scout movements like they used to. We're seeing in Massachusetts, uh, town after town, county after county, Boy Scout districts, as they're called, merging. These are like councils, if you will, uh, of multiple towns. They're merging and merging and merging. Currently, the Camp Resolute Camp is owned by what was uh, just recently called Knox Trail Council, which has now merged with the scouts going down into Natick, Framingham, and will probably be using a scout camp in Plymouth. And so massive consolidation of Boy Scout units. 
not to be rescued by the national headquarters in Texas. Therefore, is there a strong possibility of Camp Resolute going away? We don't know that. I have asked that question pointedly to scout leaders in the other area. Our unit for Bolton is based in Fitchburg and Lemonster, so we're not necessarily affected by it, and we do not own the scout uh, camp, Resolute, uh, locally for our own Boy Scouts. Our kids go up to Jaffrey, New Hampshire. The point being that Resolute certainly may be a camp that would be on the chopping block. I don't have that in any short term, but if you think about it, this is a camp that was probably once rural, was very attractive in the old days, and now it's on the interstate with a big cell tower casting a shadow over it. Not a very rural experience for Boy Scouts. There are many other camps in these other merged areas that would probably be a better location. So it could be a very uh, advantageous purchase uh, by someone, some developer, to feed money back into the Boy Scout uh, districts and councils. It would be quite a plum. And the Boy Scouts are constantly looking for money. I can tell you, with 20 years, there's all kinds of fundraising. It's an endless, endless chore of asking parents for money, selling popcorn, selling wreaths. It's kind of all about money. Yes, it's a great program for the boys, but it's all about money. And therefore, our beach at Resolute, I think in the long term, is definitely in danger. And I think you would be trading uh, what's kind of a hopeful thing for a sure thing by looking at this property. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have one more amendment to be proposed here, and I'm going to let Stan do that. Excuse me. Since the previous amendment failed in terms of removal, uh, since the previous amendment uh, uh, failed about uh, not including private funds, uh, I want to make an amendment to the article such that, that there's a time frame for when the f raised f or uh, volunteer or volunteer money uh, can be raised because right now there is no end date here. So the way the article works is, is that the town must raise and appropriate the full amount of the million fifty thousand. The grant money would be a reimbursement of, of a portion of that. So if we either get less than 400000 or we don't get the grant, the way the article is structured is that there would be equivalent fundraising. But there's no time frame for when the fundraising needs to be complete. And I think it would be very appropriate that we do have a time frame. So my amendment is uh, on page two. Uh, it says, provided, however, that funds appropriated here under shall not be expended unless the town is approved for a parkland acquisitions and renovation for communities park grant from the Massachusetts Division of Conf Conservation Services, or the amount of any such grant plus the amounts raised privately equal at least 400000 and here's where the amendment goes, and that said monies be fully raised on or before the uh, execution of the purchase and sale agreement. Okay, we've got an amendment and a second. And the amendment is to, can you, can you bring that to us over here, Stan? What is the date? So the amendment is to Again, on page two of the warrant, when we, when we get to the point of uh, any such grants raised privately equal to 400,000, and that's where you would insert it, and that said uh, monies be fully raised on or before, I'm sorry, on or before the execution of the purchase and sale agreement. That's to tie those two things together. Is there any comment on that amendment? Noldill, Nashway Road. Uh, that amendment, I think, because of the wording uh, to uh, the date of the PNS being uh, executed, 
uh, is very constrictive because there's no reason that the town couldn't go out and execute a PNS next week and subvert the intent of this. I would rather see a hard date in the April time frame or a date that is related to a closing date that's agreeable to all parties, uh, the Girl Scouts and the town, and no sooner okay. than some specific date, rather than constraining the uh, uh, people who are in favor of this project by constricting us with a uh, impossible to meet deadline. Other questions or comments about the amendment? I, I'm going to ask that you not. <laughs> I don't think we need that vote because um, I don't see any other on moving the question. I don't see any other um, debate on that question, so we will vote on the amendment. The amendment, as uh, proposed, is to tie the date uh, to the execution of the purchase and sale. So it's locking it into that time frame. All those in favor say yes. Yes. All opposed, no. No. OK. That is a close vote. Let's try one more time. I don't think it'll be different, but, uh, and this is a simple majority. All those in favor say yes. Yes. All those opposed, no. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, not seeing a clear majority there. We're gonna have to take a ballot vote on this amendment. If we could have the, uh, So I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is a hand vote by ballot, meaning the way that we do this is everyone was issued a pink, I believe, wand. Uh, each person, each voter has one. Um, we are going to first ask for those all in favor of the amendment who want to vote yes for the amendment, don't do it yet, but to raise your ballots. And we're gonna ask you to hold those up during the time that we count them, as long as that takes. And then we'll ask you to put them down, and then we'll count the no's. Okay, and we are voting now on the amendment to fix the date, to be tied to the date that the purchase and sale is executed. And we're going to get our, uh, our ballot takers ready. Is there any questions about how we're going to do the ballot? And then after we determine the vote of this amendment, we'll see if there's any other new information. Otherwise, we can vote on the actual main motion. So this is not the main motion. This is the amendment. So this is now a vote by raised pink ballot. All those in favor of a yes vote on the amendment to fix the date to the date of the purchase and sale, raise your ballot and please keep it up until we ask you to take it down. Thank you.
Are we done? With the yes. All set? Okay, you can put your hands down. Thank you. Hang on. Tom? Okay. Now, if everyone who would like to vote no on the amendment to fix the date to the date of the purchase and sale, raise your pink hand to vote. And please keep it up. Tom, are you done counting? Okay, you can you can lower your hands. Thank you. This is the time that the moderator reads from some very interesting piece of information to keep you entertained, and I'm sorry that I wasn't prepared. I will next time, I promise.
And again, just to uh, state the obvious, this is a vote on the amendment, and we still need to vote on the main motion. Thank you for counting that vote. Uh, the amendment fails. It did not gain a majority. Um, so, I'm happy to share with you <laughs> that the count was 190 against and 128 for. Um, is there any new information? Margaret. Hi, Margaret Campbell from Spectacle Hill Road. I was on the committee that um, mm -hmm. helped prepare the grant and collect all the information that we've shared with you thus far on preserving the land. I just wanted to add that I had some extensive conversations with the folks that run the Nara Park in Acton, and they are so and a couple of other things that to me personally sounded really awesome about it is they have 60 part-time 60 part employees at, at Nara Park. And that just sounds like a great jobs program. They're all paid for off of the camp that they run there uh, on the park as well as um, events that they have. Yeah, and they have a new pavilion. The pavilion is just recently put in. They, they, um, they've they been running the park for a number, a number of years. So it wasn't all done overnight. It's taken time. Um, so in addition to the 60 seasonal employees, which is awesome, um, the camp runs, uh, they have anywhere 50 to 70 kids. Um, uh, on the camp. They have 40 acres of land, so less land than we have. They do have a beachfront like, like we do. Um, and uh, it's their, their cost for the camp is $245. Now, I had my kids in camp and daycare and with two working uh, parents, you know, it was always a scramble to try to figure that out. It's wonderful to be able to have that in town. I did take advantage of Tom Denny for, you know, a week or two a year, but I think to have a more rigorous, um, sort of robust, maybe plan camp opportunity that this property alone offers, not <coughs> properties across the, uh, the town. So I do ask you to please think about the long term, think about the future, um, I'm one of those that this isn't going to uh, impact me that that much, but I think for generations to come, it's it's. Well, the only other thing I want to say is that we're talking about 1.4 million dollars is what we're going to be looking at for other expenditures. That happens to be the exact figure of an overrun in the school budget about seven or ten years ago. We had a financial um, officer who uh, misspent the money, and, and we basically lost $1.4 million. There was no way to, get, to collect that from, from anyone. There was no raising that through taxes. So what happened is the school uh, Excuse me, Mark. That's not really germane to this issue. Uh, my point is that we had 60 volunteers in that school every day helping out to make it work we didn't we uh, we therefore um, made up the loss of 1.4 million dollars through this community and i feel that we can do the same with camp virginia thank you thank you okay i see uh four more people let's see if we can get each person to give al you're next 
Thanks, Doug. Brief. Uh, yeah, thanks, Doug. I just want to say that introduce that, yourself, Al. Oh, Al, Al Ferry, Pinewood Road. I just want to point out that this is different from a lot of these other projects. We hear about you know, expenditures and so on uh, year to year, year to year, but this is an opportunity. The state's going to put up a large quantity of the money, largely through the efforts of uh, Sudbury Valley trustees. And if you think about, and this is one of the few opportunities, they don't come around very often. One of them was the expansion of Bowers Springs. Another one was the winery. There are these things that come up. We don't plan on them. There's a, we don't really know what the best thing to do there is, but we have to act or not act. But it, there is not going to be similar, up, very many similar opportunities. Costs go up, taxes go up when the population goes up. The population has increased every year since I've been here, and the taxes have gone up too. They don't go down when the population goes up. And the idea of having only 10 houses there is probably an underestimate. It could be a lot more, so the tax, uh, taxes are probably ultimately a wash. But it still is an opportunity, and we should think about it you know, in comparison to some of the upper to other opportunities that have worked out, and maybe some of the ones we've missed. Thank you. This microphone. Bob Rossadini of Wilder Road. Uh, I have a question, and uh, obviously I have a concern about open space and preserving open space in the rural nature of the town. I also respect the selectman's position, advisory's position. The concern I have is um, the $70 or whatever number that, that we have before us uh, impact on our taxes is not a huge number. The concern I have is, is there some alternative to this? Let's say we approve it. I listened to Mr. Troop talk about the things that we could do with that property, and I see nothing but more annual expense, uh, another organization in town, staffing. Uh, let's say we approve it. At what point in time, who are the decision makers that say how we expand the use of this property? Uh, can we spend the money, save the property, but Will someone be, uh, shall we say, riding shotgun on just how this land is used? Uh, and in particular, when we talk about opening up to citizens of other towns. So, my Thank question. You. Randy? Randy Dingen, uh, Water Aquatic Hill Road. Uh, it's tough to get up here and talk uh, and certainly have a position against this piece of property because it's a beautiful piece of property. My, my kids have enjoyed it, and um, it's certainly something that I can see why people are passionate about, and I, and I commend the group for, for um, organizing around it. Uh, one thing I do know is that I've sat at that table for uh, a period of time where I banged my head against the wall uh, regarding the tax rate. If I had a dollar for every person during my six or seven years at that table that asked me why our taxes are so high, I would be able to buy Camp Virginia on my own. <laughs> the reason that our taxes are so high is because we are constantly entertaining expenses like this. There is uh, a point in which we need to stop uh, and be uh, fiscally conservative and work to get our taxes under control. There was a previous speaker that talked about how our borrowing has gone down over the past few years, or the past number of years. That is exactly by design. That was one of the main things that I tried to do when I sat at that table, was to get borrowing under control, stop new borrowing so that our taxes would go down. We actually, in a couple of budget cycles, were actually able to lower the taxes and give money back. We've seemed to get away from that some, sometimes. And sometimes the nice piece of property you just can't afford. There, if I've learned anything, in my 15 years in town here is that there will be something like this every year and sometimes twice a year. Uh, we have to have some restraint. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Ramosco, Sugar Road, and um, full disclosure, I'm the chair of the school committee. 
I've noticed, and I'm going to keep my comments brief, but I've noticed um, in social media and then here tonight that in some respects the schools have been pulled into reasons to and not to make this purchase. And I would respectfully ask you to pull your discussion. Ten homes is not going to harm our school budget. And I would like to say to the speaker that came up before, our school is financially healthy. Our district is doing well. We have worked very hard. The teachers have worked very hard. The administration has worked very hard to dig our district in a very uncomfortable financial position over the last two years. Please, if you're going to make a discussion or a decision, make a decision on the merits of this property, not on what it's going to do and how it's going to blow up our schools. And one, a couple of things I want you to understand. The population at this high school has gone down over the past years. It's not because we don't have school choice anymore, because our youngest school choice children are in sixth grade. So we've got several more years for those kids to work their way through the system. I also heard that there was something about um, people getting upset because there, was, um, there were three first grade classes in Bolton, and this won't take long. Three first grade classes in fourth, but I want you to understand the reason why we're adding a fourth, because last year the principal said, we don't need that fourth class, let's take it away. So we're not adding a fourth grade class because we have too many kids in the town. We're restoring that fourth grade class because of the children in the first grade and the needs that they have. Plus, frankly, I think the class is first grade anyway for three classes. But my point is, if you're going to make a decision about this piece of property, all the way going back to June when there was a letter to the editor and it started then with talking about the schools, don't pull the schools into something. I mean, I'm going to be coming forward to ask you for some money real soon because we need some help and we will have our numbers. But don't use schools to make your decision. Thank you. I see two more speakers over here. Wayne, I think you were waiting. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Jesse Davis. I live on Drumlin Hill Road. I'm here just because I have a little piece of information that has not been covered. I'm also a Girl Scout leader, and every year we go to Camp Green Erie for our encampment. And every year it's getting harder and harder for our girls to have their encampment experience because it's overbooked. So we, are your Girl Scouts are already hoping to get into Camp Virginia. We will be paying customers. That's all I have Thank to you. say. Okay. I think it's just appropriate for Wayne to finish up here. Wayne Wetzel, 42 Harvard Road. In response to a speaker over there, I'm the, I don't know what you're looking up at. 75 years, just short of 50 years in town. I've sat at both these tables almost as long as Ken Troop. And <laughs> What I, what I want you to think about is, we're talking about looking ahead into the future and so forth. Some of these items that you heard mentioned about expenditures that are, they're sort of near term kind of stuff. I think about things like, have you ever heard of unfunded pension liabilities? The Commonwealth of Massachusetts is one of the worst uh, states in the union in terms of underfunded pension liabilities. I haven't heard a word about that mentioned. Uh, when you used to drive down Forbish Mill Road to the dump, you remember on the right-hand side, the stump with the yellow reflector sign in front of it? The yellow reflector sign says to a lawyer, hey, when my client crashes into that stump and dies, Bolton recognized the problem but wasn't willing to spend the money to take the stump down. The guardrails all over town that, you know, and I've been there sitting there arguing about, uh, you know, cut the budget, cut the budget, cut the budget. Every one of those guardrails that's rusting and falling down, when somebody goes off the road there and their client dies, I'm, thank God I'm not a lawyer because I'd take you for everything you own. We've got liabilities staring us in the face for the foreseeable future that I can't even imagine how we're ultimately going to solve them. And 
you know, do I love this property? Hell, I started out in the town and the conservation commission. I've contributed to the conservation trust. I've done all those things. I've mostly supported every land purchase we've ever done. But, you know, this is a nice to have. This isn't an obligation of the town that it needs to have. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. I think we've been all around this issue, and, and you've spoken as well, haven't you? Well, I, I think you've already spoken. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, I think we really have given a very good, vigorous debate to this, and I, I think we're ready to take a vote. Okay. So we're going to try a voice vote, and um, I'm not very optimistic. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to point that out. This is a two-thirds majority, so in order for this to pass, two-thirds must vote in favor. So we'll start, and, and, and let me just say, let's, I'm only going to do it once. Let's just all say yes or no in our normal voice. I'll, I'll get it. You don't have to scream. So all those in favor of the main motion for the town to purchase 50 acres of land for $1,077,000, 77700 I believe, uh, please say yes. Yes. All those opposed, please say no. No. Okay, we are going to take a hand ballot. <laughs> Thank you. That was what I expected. <laughs> All right, so we did this once, so everybody knows what we're doing. We got our pink ballots. And once we have our ballot takers ready, to purchase the Camp Virginia property, please raise your ballots and keep them up. Thank you. All right. I found something to read. This is about the town meeting. The town meeting form of government, while extremely old, is not well known nor understood outside of rural and suburban New England. <laughs> we know all about it. People with the easy mobility of today moving into town meeting country from big cities or from outside New England find themselves at a loss to understand the local government and their new hometowns, that they're able to vote. Furthermore, there is no readily available source to which they can turn to inform themselves. Our town meeting of today is the end product of a continuous evolution in local government which has been going on uninterruptedly for well over 1,500 years. Not here, but in the UK. Of which the last 1,000 are reasonably well documented. I'm going to skip. We're, we're going to go through Roman times and it goes back that far. is very long. Ah, here we are. In the early 1600s, little bands of Englishmen came to settle on the American continent. Those who came to Massachusetts Bay came not for adventure, as in Virginia, nor for commercial reasons, but primarily to avoid persecution and domination by their government. 
But when they stepped ashore and their ship sailed away, they found themselves not only free of persecution, but also free of all the customary support of an established government. They had 3,000 miles of cold gray Atlantic at their back and what turned out to be 3,000 miles of howling wilderness before them. The animals and most of the Indian inhabitants of that wilderness were definitely unfriendly. Well, I don't know, that's what this says. Town meetings were held in the new towns, Plymouth, Boston, Salem, and Gloucester whenever there was a question to be decided. Are we done counting the yeses? Yes, yeses are done. Are we ready for no's? Okay, all those opposed to purchasing the Camp Virginia property, please raise your ballots and keep them up. Meetings were held at irregular intervals, but frequently, sometimes every Monday morning. How's that sound? <laughs> As in England, attendance at town meetings was obligatory for all freemen who owned land in the town. How many voters do you have? We have about 3,900 registered voters. They're not all here. <laughs> Thank goodness. I mean, it would be hard to fit. Until 1694, no man could be a voter unless he was a landholder and a church member. Abraham Lincoln described American democracy as a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And so it is. We in New England can be proud of our heritage and proudly carry on its ancient and well-tested form, which seems to suit us well. Okay, you can put your hands down. All set with the count. Okay. This is probably a good time to point out that there is an election next week, Tuesday, December 5th. Um, and in the event that this does pass, it requires a vote, a majority vote, a simple majority vote at that town election, okay? So in the event that it passes, uh, any, any, everyone would want to go to vote and express their opinion on this at the polls, uh, so be sure you remember that. Um, I don't know what happens if it doesn't. The vote is to approve the funding. And thanks, everyone, for uh, being very patient and listening to what everyone had to say here tonight.
Thanks, Tom. Thank you to all the counters. Okay, we have a vote. There were 134 against, 182 in favor. 182 is not two-thirds, so it fails. That being taken care of, I would uh, entertain a motion to dissolve the meeting. Second. All those in favor? Yes. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>